Morris took off his cloak and placed it across the back of his saddle. Underneath he was wearing a heavy leather jerkin and body armour. Around his waist was a belt which supported a short sword and a heavy knife. Grimly he took hold of his thick spear, a weapon more suited for war than for hunting, and then keeping himself hidden in the woods he set off in pursuit of Cludog. He was heading through the forest in the direction of the nunnery where Imogen was held. The broad hooves of Morris's war horse prevented it from sinking into the soft, dank, swamp earth of the wood. It was a beautiful beast. Its chestnut coat shone as the sunlight reflected through the trees. Morris had decided to take this particular route, as it was shorter by half the distance than travelling directly over the mountains and dangerous rocky crags. He was not in the habit of choosing the roughest, most difficult routes. The ride across the marsh was slow in the warm weather of August. The swamp which he rode his horse across would have been about 12 inches deep, and his horse would have had extreme difficulty had he attempted to ride it across it in the winter. Morris had deliberately avoided the, sharp, the darker patches of marshy ground. The dead, rotting vegetation contained a lot of moisture and squelched beneath the horse's feet. He had anticipated the swamp to be bone dry in weather such as it was. The warm golden sun shone down relentlessly, and blue sky hung over the mountains like a vast blanket. In the distance the mountains looked beautiful, as they are multicoloured with flowers, lilacs blended with the green, bluebells were less prominent. Butterflies moved through the air erratically, and the sweet smell of summer flowers blended with the fragrance of rotten undergrowth. Morris knew that Cladder would be near the nunnery. He had sp slipped away quietly to meet Imogen on the banks of the river Mono. He knew that Cladaug would instinctively make for cover if he suspected that Morris was in pursuit of him. He had decided to get it over with that very day. Making his way on the war horse which he prided, tunnelling through some dense undergrowth, deliberately taking a route where he would not be seen, he avoided allowing Cladaug any indication or warning. Only flickers of sunlight flitted, filtered through the hedges and bushes. There would be no way for Cladow to see him coming, and it would be very unlikely for anyone else to see him. The conscious feeling of the heat of summer caused him to sweat a little, and with his long spear he cut his way through the shrubs, willows, bushes, thrusting forward. He observed the scenery in the distance and knew there was only a little more vegetation to get through before, more determined with every step, aware of the reason for his mission and necessary task. Without courage, men would cease to exist. As Morris came nearer to the clearing, confidence showed all over his face. He took the reins of the horse, tugging slightly for the beast to increase its pace. However, he remained cautious as he could now see the clear blue horizon above a few cone-shaped mountains. Morris was familiar with the area. He never consulted a map to help him know which direction to go in. Yet there were no prominent landmarks, and the landscape of the country seemed too irregular to be distinguishable. But Morris knew his direction. He had been through and had passed by this area many times before. It all looked peaceful and familiar. In his childhood he had played on the mountains, climbed the trees and run in the open. He recalled the times he had spent fishing and swimming in the river Wye. Days in his youth, without responsibility. Days he thought would never end and happy days he would not forget. The squawking of a kestrel playing upon a rabbit or a rat disturbed his reverie. Morris watched the bird of prey with interest as it carried away its evening meal. He was curious to know how his son Arthur would turn out. He remembered when himself and Ombros would bath him and dress him. Morris enjoyed feeding little Arthur and was always glad to return from a hunt to see his bouncing baby boy welcome him back. The journey was not planned or prepared for. In fact, a king of Morris's stature had not the slightest fear 
He had been in several wars and was not too concerned in disposing of Cladog. It was all simple. He had to make a detour to the River Mono, kill the enemy, then make his way back. He had not even considered opting out of the hunt to do this terrible task. As he made his way across a few low hills, he noticed a small village of timber dwellings where a few local peasants lived. The village could be seen faintly in the distance between two prominent mountains. After turning amid innumerable curves and making his way through patches of trees, the mono was clearly in sight. He knew that to allow Cladow to live would be a threat and a menace to the nation. Morris had almost been half-hearted as he prepared himself to go alone. Not for the thrill of it. He had a clear sense of priority, and he was looking forward to getting his terrible task over with. He was a man with a keen sense of justice. He had proven that many times. But he also had the good sense to get rid of this menace whose behaviour had become intolerable. Morris was comparatively flesh, fresh, although he had just been on an arduous hunt. But it was his habit to always seize the first chance when killing an enemy. He gripped his long war spear, which he had brought to do the job, and slowly moved towards an earth mound towards the mono behind which he knew Cladog would be waiting. He had already worked out the strategy. Move up to the man steadily and swiftly plunge the spear through his torso, provided Cladow did not suspect anything or had no warning. It would be quick and simple. He reached the foot of the earth mound. He quietly walked his horse, stroking it gently on the neck, and momentarily it chewed the roots and woodland plants. The trees were quite tall and prevented most of the sunlight from baking the banks of the river Mono. He looked up and watched the pale blue sky and the white summery clouds. A few pigeons and smaller birds drifted in the air. Morris steadily moved forward between the trees and bushes with a spear in his hand. He clenched it tightly with his sweaty palm. It felt so smooth and warm like himself. Calmly and confidently he reached Cladog within twenty yards and gazed through the bushes to see Cladog sitting on a smooth rounded rock with his back to him. Cladog's horse was tied loosely to a tree and chewing clover in the reeds on the river bank. Beyond the woods he could see large areas of open land most of which was used for grazing sheep by the peasants. He saw no point in delaying, so he steadily moved towards the sitting man with a spear in his hand, frowning as if he considered the job beneath him. He felt no desire to speak to him, for his thoughts revolved in only one direction, whereas Cladot's thoughts were totally on meeting Imogen. This major killing would cause a sensation. As he drew nearer, he saw Cladog idly tossing stones into the stream, as if bored. He noticed Cladog was armed with a long hunting knife, which was hanging from a thin, string-like leather bend on it, band on his right hip. A slight breeze passed through the trees, bushes and shrubs, as Morris suddenly plunged his heels into the horse's side, and his horse galloped with tremendous energy. Morris took a deep breath and levelled his spear, crouching low in his shadow as he was almost on top of Cladog. Morris's face became inscrutable as he arched forward on his horse. He aimed to plunge the spear through Cladog. For a moment he saw his terrified gaze as Cladog managed to dart sideways and the spear only caught him on the side of his upper left leg. Morris was determined to kill this troublemaker. His horse was excited but under control, shifting its legs to the response of Morris's tugs in various directions on the reins. Morris lifted his spear upward again, calculating at great speed, keeping moving and maintaining his balance upon his warhorse. Cladog was startled and staggering blindly as Morris attempted another thrust of the spear to kill him. Cladog lurched sideways in time to avoid a succession of savage probes. He toppled backwards into the river and got up again, moving backwards as the blood oozed out of the open wound in his upper left leg. The water around him turned murky red with the blood from Cladog. Morris caught Cladog in the side with one swift jab of the spear. The wound was not fatal. 
but severe enough to cause throbbing somewhere near his kidney. His mind reeled, he was racked with pain. Morris saw his eyes were burning with hatred. Cladag had so far managed to keep alive, he knew that Morris was out to kill him. He felt anger inside of him because Morris had attempted to kill him by surprise. It was more painful than the wounds he had just received. Morris made another attempt as he jumped off his horse with a spear held upward. Cladag's mind clouded and he jerked, desperate now, struggling with dread at feverish speed to deprive Morris of his advantage. Morris came forward ready to jab out at any opportunity. Then Cladog picked up a smooth rock from the riverbed, about two and a half feet below the surface. With all his force behind the swing, he hurled the rock at Morris and caught him on the side of his thigh. He had succeeded in causing Morris some discomfort. He had hoped to kill him. They were both up to their thighs in murky water, mostly by mud which they had unsettled, but also by blood. Cladog's leg had been badly mauled, but the most deadly, deathly injury was the opening near his kidneys. His feet were bleeding from minor cuts from the sharp stones on the riverbed. He had numerous other grazes on his elbows and arms. Morris was cool with the determination of professionalism. He darted right, suddenly pretending that he was about to hurl the spear directly at Cladog. He knew that if he could contrive to make Cladog think he had lost his balance, Cladog might come directly at him, leaving himself open. Then Morris would be able to plunge the spear into him. Morris tumbled sideways as if he had tripped over a rock on the riverbed. But with a spear in his hand, he knew it would be difficult to topple and that it was unlikely for Cladog to fall for such a trick. In any case, there were too many rocks and boulders on the river bed for either of them to dash forward with any speed. The only way to get close to one another would be to literally dive, hurl oneself forward. Morris decided to take a chance with a spear. He had taken the same chance before and it had worked. He assumed he had a good chance of catching Cladog in the chest if he hurled a spear forward like a javelin in a sports event. He carefully calculated his distance. He knew that if he missed, or if Cladog was swift enough to avoid the spear he intended to throw, then he would be without the advantage. Retaining his balance in the sluggishly flowing river, Morris seized the chance, and with astonishing speed, he hurled the spear at Cladog. Cladog saw it coming, but was not quite fast enough. He half avoided it, but nevertheless it caught him on the side of his right ribcage. He yelled in pain as, he, as a spear tore between his ribs. Then he tottered and fell sideways, desperately heaving the spear from his ribs with both hands. It was more painful than he could imagine it to be. The sharp spear had ripped into him and hung from his torso, as it would had it been hurled into the bark of a tree. His gashed hands were bleeding from where he had fallen, and he put his hands out, only to have them cut by the sharp stones in the riverbed. The wound in his thigh became gore as he groaned in pain. He could almost assess his death. Morris's muscles were agile and still strong. He moved towards Cladog, whose brain seemed to have become soft and lost its alertness. He wished he had listened to King Theodric, as his mind spun merely with thoughts of his terrible mistake. However, although his mind was too sluggish for subtleties, he was still not dead. He had had a hazardous experience, but knew there was still a chance to defeat Morris. Not much of a chance, but a chance. If he kept his head and asserted himself from his soul, although most of his strength had ebbed, he was a fit young man and had no intention of giving up Morris lashed out with his knife and again caught Cludog in the side, within a couple of inches from the heart. The state his victim was in almost made his stomach turn. Damn you to hell, you swine, Morris! I will curse you and King Theodric! You are not worthy to shovel dung! groaned Cludog with desperation in his voice. He had his knife in his hand and knew that Morris intended to finish him off, no matter what he said. The only possible hope he could have was to attempt to take on Morris in the knife fight, 
remembering that Morris himself had been hurt. Morris was goading Cludog into frenzy. He noticed his face become paler, mainly due to loss of blood. Soon it would turn to waxy, sickly, glistening colour. The sun gleamed pale orange through the trees, while ducks and other fowl were scurrying among the vegetation on the riverbank. The sight of Cludog's wounds was sickly. Morris could see the glutinous substance on the wound on Cludog's side. Cludog turned in, a, in an attempt to find a spear from among the rocks and vegetation of the riverbed. He knew that if he did find it, he would have a chance of killing Morris. Cludog glared at Morris for a moment. Hatred flickered from his eyes. It was not necessary to speak to show his feelings. He continued to back away from Morris defensively, thrusting out with his knife, not daring to go forward. The loss of blood had drained most of his strength, and his shoulders and limbs were twitching from the strain of trying to keep alive. His body was stiff, and his muscles had lost most of their suppleness. In one final attempt to retain his life, Cladaug frantically plunged forward like a mad animal lashing out haphazardly with his long hunting knife. But Morris was too quick. He grabbed Cladaug's right arm, twisted it back as he had been taught to do in single combat, and gouged his own knife deep into Cladaug's left shoulder. He groaned again in agony as Morris pressed his knife deep up to the hilt. Cladaug was slipping into a nightmare of the worst sort. His head boiled and spun. Morris jerked the knife from Cladaug's shoulder one sharp heave. Cladaug went sprawling down, but Morris took hold of his hair. And at that moment, while Cladaug was on his knees, Morris thrust his knife into his temple, splitting his head open. Yuck. He was dead. Suddenly, the country sounds became more noticeable in the silence which now prevailed. Morris was aware of the ripple of the water around his thighs. Dragonflies and other water insects seemed to emerge. It seemed that half the country's suffering lay between Morris and the dead victim. The sound of thrushes, finches and other birds filled the quiet air with renewed noise. The sun moved overhead. Page 77. The Funeral of Cladog. Everything went well for about two miles, the bishops leading the way and the hundreds of monks chanting and singing the funeral hymns. The procession was passing along a river bank through some very fine pasture land when suddenly it came to a halt. Nothing happened for several minutes and the whole cortege waited patiently. King Theodoric edged his horse alongside that of Morris. I thought that might happen, he whispered quietly. This is going to cost us. What's happening? asked Morris as Guggen Mao rode up to join them. A miracle is happening, that's what's happening, my boy, said Guggen, hardly able to control his laughter. Oh, you will learn all about it quick enough. They sat watching as Bishop Dovrig left the head of the column, where the milling monks were gathered around the ox cart and walked back towards them. Theodric leaned over in his saddle towards Morris. He will tell you that the ox cart has broken down and that it has suddenly become an incredible weight, and by divine providence the oxen flatly refused to go one step further. Theodric was smiling grimly. Then he will tell you that this is an act of God, or the will of God, and that it means that Cladog has to be buried here. Very well, then. Bury him here. Let's get over with and get home, said Morris impatiently. That's exactly it said Guggen, smiling at Morris. If you bury Cladog here, then you will have to build a church. Then you'll have to give this land around here to the church. And damn good land it is too, said Guggen reflectively. Uh, no funeral ox cart ever breaks down on bad land. Bishop Dovrig was approaching them, and all three sat upright in their saddles, looking as solemn as they could manage. He strolled up to Morris and stopped in front of his horse and addressed him as the senior king. The divine, divine will of God has intervened to show where the resting place of Cladog must be. The funeral cart is made as heavy as the world itself, and the oxen cannot draw it on a pace further. 
Bishop Doverig made his statement solemnly, staring straight at King Morris, his younger cousin. King Cledwin had ridden up to hear this statement. He was obviously upset at the delay of his son's funeral. Maurice was not going to be easily beaten down by Doverig, but something about the bishop's look and tone of voice warned him that Doverig had guessed very clearly what had happened to Cledaug. Let us wait then until the wrath of God passes over and we can take the body of poor Cledaug to his resting place. We cannot bury him here, for he must be buried in holy land in the church, as you, a bishop, well know. Morris was quite able to fence words with Doverig. Clint Dudwin was becoming upset and anxious, and was clearly agitated over the delay of his son's funeral. My lord Morris, we must proceed with the funeral. God forbid that my son's soul should be sent to hell. He is damned if the oxen refuse to draw him onto holy land. Morris looked at the old man and he suddenly realised that he had no idea that he, Morris, had killed his son. He felt pity and sorrow for the old man and whilst he was prepared to sit and argue all day with Bishop Doverig, he was not prepared to inflict further suffering upon old Cludwin. Perhaps if a few prayers were said, then the wrath of God might be lifted, suggested Theodric. He was ever prepared to negotiate, even with God. Bishop Dufferick shook his head, for he now knew that he had a fight on his hands. God is not angry with the soul of Cladog. He was martyred in the holy cause of the church. God has now chosen him to be one of his saints in heaven. The bishop spread his arms wide and gazed at the skies above. Morris, Theodric and Gurgan looked at each other in amazement. Old Cladwim was equally amazed, but for a totally different reason. His son was now among the saints, the elect of heaven. There was no doubt now that Bishop Doverig was going to win this argument and get his land. How can we then uh, obey this miracle which God has granted to us? asked Morris, eyeing the bishop coldly with much disfavour. Doverick answered him immediately. It is a clear sign that God has chosen this spot to be the resting place of his chosen saint. The new Saint Cladaug must be buried here along by the river, near the ford. Old Cladwin was agog with this incredible revelation that his son was a saint. I will buy this land. I will give it to the church and grant it so that my son may rest here in the place which God has chosen. The old man was getting carried away with the whole idea. Maurice turned and looked at his father. Theodric shrugged his shoulders, and Gugan raised his eyebrows and looked up to heaven. King Gladwin then lost them the argument. They could have sat on their horses for hours if necessary. Finally the oxen would have become thirsty or hungry and they would have moved forward regardless of any attempt by the monks to hold them still. If only Cludwin had kept his mouth shut, his son would still have been a saint, and he could have been buried in a church three miles further on for nothing. Morris coughed and looked as solemn as he could. Saints do not belong to families, King Cludwin. They belong to the nation. Therefore I, as paramount king, would have the honour of granting and paying for this land which shall be given to the church. Let St. Cladug be buried here in the place where God has chosen for him. Morris stood, stared hard at Dovrig, who looked back coolly, showing no emotion whatsoever. The Bishop Dovrig got the message very clearly, however, from the king's manner and tone, that unless he were very careful, he might also meet with an accident and St. Doverig would be singing in heaven before his appointed time. News of the miracle spread quickly among the people and along the column of soldiers, and amidst the great excitement over this marvellous event, the bishops accompanied by King Cladwin traced out the boundaries of the land which is to be granted to the church from along the lush meadows along the river bank. 
The monks marked the extent of the land with small piles of stones taken from the river. And in all, they marked out about 36 acres of land. A grave was dug and a cairn of stones was raised over it once the coffin had been placed in. Whilst all this was going on, Morris and his father and father-in-law went and sat on the river bank. Their horses grazed the nearby grass and their households and clansmen waited respectfully. It seems that our good Bishop Dovrig has won yet again, said old Guggen Maur. He never misses an opportunity, does he? It's incredible, said Morris bitterly. This blasted man, Cladow, is obstinate as a mule, chasing a woman round a nunnery. He endangers the whole nation with a possible silver war over this stupidity, and now he's a saint. Morris was spluttering with rage. His father, Theodoric, was more thoughtful, and was already looking for the advantages in the situation. I think we ought to build a church over Cladogue, a good one. Maybe in stone, like they do in France and Italy. We can make it a centre for pilgrims, you know, uh, popularise it. Morris was angry. That damn man has already cost me 36 acres of land and a lot of trouble. Now you expect me to build an expensive church for him, and my cousin Dovrig will get all sorts of gifts from pilgrims. Your father is right. By making Cladogue the nuisance into Cladogue the holy martyr, who is now a saint, we can remove all possible causes of bitterness. No one will ever want to take any revenge. It's perfect. Everybody be happy. Rugen Maurer weighed up the situation exactly the same way as Theodric. Cladaug had now become a force for unity. The solemn funeral procession had long since disintegrated, and the news of the miracle had created an almost carnival atmosphere. People helped to pile stones to mark the boundaries of Cladaug's new church, and they crowded around the grave site of the new saint. Finally, the whole procession formed up again, and they returned to the manor house from which they had come. There King Morris made the announcement that he would erect a church over the grave of Cladog to honour the new saint. King Cladwin and the rest of his family and clan were greatly pleased at the High King's generosity, and clearly pleased at having a saint in their family. Then Morris and all the other kings set out back to their own homes. Immediately there were wild stories of miracles at the tomb of St. Cladog. That very night local farmers and peasants claimed that they had seen a pillar of fire standing above the grave. The reign of King Morris had begun very well indeed. The church of St. Cladog still stands to this very day. End of chapter 4